Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the Harvard Catholic Forum. I am Deacon Tim O'Donnell, the program director here, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the second event in our spring 2021 series on faith in art. The Harvard Catholic Forum has a mission to share the riches of Catholic thought and culture with the academic, professional, and artistic worlds of Cambridge and Boston and beyond. In addition to our lectures, we offer non-credit courses and are continuing to broaden our programming. The forum is a project of the Harvard Catholic Center, St. Paul's Parish, Harvard Square, and the St. Paul's Choir School. Together, we make up a vibrant Catholic presence in the midst of the Harvard campus. Check out our website at www.harvardcatholicforum.org where you can sign up for our newsletters and register for future events. And please consider supporting our important mission by making a financial contribution. This event will be archived as all of ours are on the Harvard Catholic Forum YouTube channel. If you like what you see and hear, please share the link to that channel with friends, colleagues, parishes, or chaplaincies that may be interested. Our post-talk YouTube participation usually exceeds the numbers that we are able to reach on day one. We are honored to have as our co-presenter for this series, the Lumen Christi Institute. Since 1997, Lumen Christi has been enriching the intellectual and cultural life of the University of Chicago and beyond with the insights of Catholic thought. Other co-sponsors from around the country include the New England chapter of the Patrons of the Arts in the Vatican Museums, the Collegium Institute's Ars Vivendi Initiative at the University of Pennsylvania, the St. Benedict Institute at Hope College, the St. Paul's Catholic University Center at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, the St. Lawrence Institute for Faith and Culture at the University of Kansas, and the Nova Forum and the Institute for Advanced Catholic Studies at the University of Southern California. After tonight's program, you will receive a questionnaire. It would be a great help to us if you would return it and give us your feedback. Before I introduce our speaker, let me give you a roadmap of today's event. The lecture segment will, will last for 30 minutes or so, and then we will have an opportunity for some Q&A. If you have a question, please use the Q&A function on Zoom to send it to us. Today's presentation brings us to the central sacramental reality of the faith, the Eucharist. In early modern Europe, this was a sacrament beset by theological critiques and the doubts of an increasingly empirical culture. Our speaker, Dr. Elizabeth Lev, whom we are pleased to have joining us for this second presentation, uh, shows how the church responded to the crisis by inspiring works of art that rendered this invisible mystery visible, both to the people of the time and to us today. Dr. Lev is a US art historian based in Rome with degrees from the University of Chicago and the University of Bologna. In addition to teaching at Duquesne University's Italian campus, she has been offering tours of the artistic riches of Rome and beyond for over 20 years. Dr. Lev is the author of four books, including How Catholic Art Saved the Faith, The Triumph of Beauty and Truth in Counter-Reformation Art in 2018. Dr. Lev, will you unmute and turn your video on? Good evening, and thank you very much for having me back. I am very, very excited to be talking about this particular subject, which is 
uh, the subject of my graduate work. It is very, very dear to me, the Eucharist in art. It was a moment of, of great eye-opening at the University of Bologna when I began to realize how deeply art reflected the spirit of the age. And so I'm gonna start, however, with something magnificent from the Renaissance. We're gonna look at the triumphant pride of Raphael's masterpiece, the visualization of theology in the Vatican Museums painted for Pope Julius II between 1508 and 1512 in fresco. And this painting was, 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 you see the apostles, the prophets, the church militant, the church triumphant, everything in the painting centers around the Holy Spirit who is facing downwards, descending like a dove to the, to the consecrated host on the altar. And we have a painting which is designed with all of these figures and all of these different things going on. The main part of the painting is a vertical from the Father to the resurrected Christ, to the Holy Spirit, to the real presence on the altar, a true triumph of the visualization of the body and blood of Christ in the Eucharist. Now, it is very, very telling that when Giorgio Vasari, the biographer of Raphael, named, saw this painting 30 years later, not in 1512, but he wrote his book in 1550. When he saw this painting 30 years later, he referred to it as the disputa, the disputation, which of course suggests that perhaps somebody in this group of saints and apostles and prophets is somehow disputing the real presence in the, in the, in the Eucharist. But that is not the case in 1512 when this is painted. But at the time Giorgio Vasari was painting, it was very much the case. The, the Eucharist had become the subject of great dispute. Starting, of course, with Martin Luther in um, 1517, who nailing up his 95 theses in the Cathedral of Wittenberg began to question long held truths of the Catholic Church. And following on Luther's footsteps were a series of other, other, other reformers, other founders, new theses, new ideas about religion, so that the people were surrounded and completely submerged with different theories, different concepts, different theologies, and faced with the problem of choice. And to make matters worse, the printing press on many, in many ways, the great triumph of the Renaissance era, also exasperated the problem by giving people pamphlets, treatises, documents, satirical books, so that all of these possibilities, all these different teachings, what is the Eucharist? Is it a symbol? Is it just bread? Is it the body of Christ? These people were inundated inundated with this kind of information, almost too much to sift through. And on top of everything else, a new kind of tone came out in these, um, these printed books. Many of these printed books were satirical. So for example, on the right, you have Lucas Cranach's satirical book on the papacy, where you see this kind of, if you will, naughty type of representation, but teaching people to laugh at the sacred, to make fun of the sacred, to belittle the sacred. And from there, the church found itself in a position where in an empirical age with many different theses, hypotheses, teachings that were going on, a flock that was very confused about the Eucharist, which is indeed the source and summit of the church. So the church was concerned about how to be able to respond to this. And as a matter of fact, one of the most important responses takes place during the Council of Trent. When in 1551, the Council of Trent will dedicate an entire session to the sacrament of the Eucharist, it'll be session 13, where they talk about the blessed sacrament, they reiterate the teaching of transubstantiation, which had already already been uh, defined in the Fourth Lateran Council. They reiterate the church's belief in, in, in Jesus's presence in the bread and wine of the, of the mass. And then posted, the council comes to a close in 1563. And how do you, you've made these proclamations, how do you make the people, the faithful, the, the folks on the street, the people who are wading their way through all these pamphlets, how do you make them understand? How do you reinforce this teaching for them? And it will be three very significant churchmen 
and will be the ones who first make an effort to try to find a way to reiterate and reinstate this teaching through art and architecture in the 16th century. The first person, of course, is Charles Borromeo, who really needs no introduction. But among the many great things that the Archbishop of Milan, of course, famous for his actions during the plague of 1576, one of the most important things for the history of art that Charles Borromeo did is that he wrote a book describing, defining series of regulations and guidelines for church architecture. So identifying that the place where the people, where the faithful go to encounter the Eucharist is indeed the sacred space of the church, Charles Borromeo started thinking about how to employ, construct the sacred space in such a way to reiterate and reinforce this teaching among the faithful when they walked into the building. And so was produced this remarkable book, which was actually published, republished, republished, and published until the late 19th, late 20th century. And the second person was St. Ignatius of Loyola, whose uh, role in, of course, after founding the Jesuit order, um, he uh, the, the the success of the Jesuits and their very, very close friendship with uh, Charles Borromeo means that the ideas that Charles Borromeo is putting forward in his treatise will actually be given a prototype thanks to the Jesuits who are building their very first church, their mother church, which will be the first church built in Rome after the Protestant Reformation. So from the beginning of the Reformation in 1517, Rome has not built new churches. But thanks to the Jesuits, the first new church to be constructed will be constructed following these ideas put forth by Charles Borromeo. And the third one, I think maybe not all, not, not, not all of you know this name. His name is Cardinal Alessandro Farnese. And where uh, Charles Borromeo and Ignatius both have saint in front of their names, it is highly unlikely that Alexander Farnese will ever receive that particular title. He was the grandson of Pope Paul III, and yes, you did hear me correctly. He was one of the wealthiest cardinals in the College of the Cardinals, and he was known as the Grand Cardinale. And he was very well known for his dislike of Charles Borromeo. This is a little teeny bit of a personal story, but I think it's quite beautiful. Um, the two of them, as very influential cardinals, both papal nephews, uh, served on several committees together. And we have the letters of Alexander Farnese saying they put me on another committee together with Charles Borromeo. He's so boring. All he ever wants to do is pray. He never goes to lunch. He doesn't throw parties. And so uh, the, the two seem to be at odds. Cardinal Alessandro Farnese, very, very good at self, self um, and promotion. The Farnese family is very, very efficient at promotion, getting the name out there, instilling a kind of memory and legacy. Um, and most importantly, he is wildly wealthy. And so since the family has a longstanding connection with the Jesuits, it was his grandfather who approved the Jesuits. Cardinal Alessandro Farnese was the man who would fit, fit, who would foot the bill for the new Jesu church in Rome. And so the first thing we're going to look at in the way that the, 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 16th, the 16th century church responded to challenges of, to the Eucharist through art is by looking at one of the great sacred spaces of the age, the church of the Jesu, designed sort of the idea of the design uh, by Charles Borromeo, although physically designed by uh, the architect Vignola, uh, made for the Jesuit order and paid for by Cardinal Farnese. And just as a little tiny note about Cardinal Farnese before we get into the meat and bones of this church, uh, what I find very moving, I, I have a great fondness for Cardinal Farnese. Um, Cardinal Farnese, what I find very moving is that during the time that he was working on the church of the Jesu with the Jesuits, sort of in close contact with them, we have of the correspondence of Cardinal Farnese's friends during this period. And the letters start to sound more and more like, Cardinal Farnese is no fun anymore. He never wants to go out to lunch. He never wants to go to parties. He's always in the chapel praying. So this wonderful story of the building of the Jesu where uh, Alessandro Farnese may have single-handedly foot the bill for this church, but the Jesuits in return saved his soul. And so it's, he's buried actually at the foot of the altar. It's a very, very lovely story of this collaboration. But to get to the point, Charles Borromeo writes very specific instructions on how a church is supposed to face out in 
into the city. He talks about a distinct facade, not touching other buildings, raised slightly up off the ground to avoid flooding and to make sure, and he specifies this, it is not in a stinky place. But the part I'm most interested in is the interior of the church because the great innovations in the first church built since the Reformation are in this interior design. And the first thing is the removal of the rood screen. One of the things that Borromeo realizes has alienated or distanced people from the Eucharist. People rarely received communion, maybe once or twice a year. People were, were, were confined to one part of the church so they couldn't physically witness the moment of consecration. And they were, they were um, separated by what is called a rood screen, R-O-O-D. It's an old English word for cross. So this idea of a barrier, a visual barrier, so that on one side, there's this great moment of consecration, as they call it, the smells and bells with the incense and the bells. And then the people who are standing on the other side without really any visual contact of what's happening. So for example, on the left-hand side, you see the church of uh, Santa Maria Sopra Minerva, the plant for our beautiful church in Rome, which you can see, this is where the rood screen would have been. It was removed uh, in, the, um, in the 17th century. The thing about the Jesu, which is the, the plan on the right-hand side, is that the Jesu is the first church built without a rood screen in centuries. And that means the church is designed with one function in mind, is to bring the faithful into the front door and focus the faithful entirely, completely, with a tunnel-like perspective towards the altar where the tabernacle placed on the altar contains the body of Christ. You come in and Jesus in the real presence on the altar is at the very the very goal or the very, the very culmination of the church. And interestingly, another interesting thing that they do in this period is this construction of side chapels. Now, in the case of Santa Maria Sopra Minerva, which you see here on the left, the church originally had just straight walls that were off on either side, but wealthy families or confraternities or friends got together and they decided to punch through the wall and make these chapels, these private chapels, which are filled with very beautiful art. But as you can see, it's a very irregular arrangement. Some are bigger, some are smaller, some are, some are, some are, some are tight, some are wide. And so it creates a kind of erratic and disorganized feeling in, inside the church. Now, Charles Borromeo would prefer to not have that kind of distracting uh, uh, sort of syncopation of different designs to the left and right, but he does want side chapels. He thinks it's very important that when people walk into the church, they see in these side chapels the sacrifice of the mass taking place so that the entire, entire church, the entire building is constantly making present the Lord. And so the Jesu resolves this problem in a very interesting way where they incorporate the side chapels into the side aisles and they create connecting doors between them. So you can start in one chapel and walk all the way down to the sacristy without ever disturbing the main space of the church in the center. So this is part of the design, this kind of tunnel vision. And then as you get to the place where the rood screen would have been, it is now substituted by the presence of a dome. And so instead of walking into this barrier, you come in and you look up and you have a preview of heaven in this lofty soaring dome that would be above your head. So let's take a look at how this works. So here is the interior of the Jesu. It's much more decorated today than originally St. Ignatius would have liked. As a matter of fact, I think St. Ignatius wanted it whitewashed, which just simply did not work out. But another very interesting sort of bone of contention between Cardinal Farnese and the Jesuit order was the fact that the Jesuits wanted their church to be like an early Christian church. And as a matter of fact, uh, Charles Borromeo did not give any specifics to how the roof of a church should be. 
So they wanted to follow in the age old tradition of an A line or a flat coffered roof. But Cardinal Farnese insisted, eventually saying simply, it's my money, it's my architect, but he insisted on this barrel vault. And anybody who has visited that church sees what a, what a brilliant idea it was, because you come into this relatively small door, this lofty ceiling kind of rounded at the top, just tunnels you. It's like a shoot bringing you down to the to the space of the altar and then on a series of steps on the top of the altar the tabernacle was placed midway between or partway between the space of the nave and the space of the altar there's this interjection of light which comes from the, the massive dome that sits on the very top. So it was, a, it was a space that really focused the entire church, the entire experience of the faithful to be able to participate in, to see the mass, to watch the priest, to see the tabernacle and to be in the presence of God. It was a very, very powerful type of art, a very, very effective form of architecture so that pretty much every church in Rome built in the wake of the Jesu is a variation on the theme for the next century and a half, more or less. This is, by the way, the original tabernacle uh, that was in the church. The, uh, the tabernacle was sold in the 19th century and made its way to Ireland, where it is in the Cathedral of Thun. But um, now this is uh, this was what was originally a very beautiful design. So this glorious temple uh, uh, sitting on top of the altar was what you would have seen had you been there back in the day. And you can see over here a painting of Urban VIII Barberini visiting the church for their 100th anniversary since the founding. You can see the ceiling hasn't been decorated yet by Gao Li. And you can see it's still whitewashed in various parts. But again, you have that that beautiful focus. I'm always a little surprised by the horse in the church. You know, it's like the horse and carriage kind of coming along the front of the church. Um, but you can see sort of not, not a terrific picture, but you can see where the tabernacle was sort of, again, the focal point of the entire space of the church. Now, uh, this idea of the tabernacle was really, this is the work of Charles Borromeo, who pretty much, as soon as he was named Archbishop of Milan, sent Peregrino Talbaldi to rearrange the apse or the presbytery of the Cathedral of Milan. And he, ultimately, Peregrino Talbaldi built this extraordinarily beautiful ciborium of the Duomo, this temple, sort of a round open temple is how he designed it, all made out of bronze and silver, surmounted by a cross. And when you're standing, when you come to the cathedral, this is on the high altar of the, of the cathedral. When you come to the point of the high altar, you look up and inside the sort of golden temple, these angels are holding up very lightly this, uh, this, this round tabernacle surrounded by images of the life of Christ that all allude to um, the Eucharist. So it's very, it's a teaching object, just like the Jesu is a teaching space, but it's also a space that's meant to create wonder and awe and amazement because you are in the presence of the Lord. And this was again picked up also in St. Mary Major, which again is one of the old, like the Cathedral of Milan, it is a very old church, but St. Mary Major is a venerable church, 1600 years old. And uh, the interior of the church had remained more or less what it was when it was first constructed by Sixtus III around 1450. But Pope Sixtus V in 1587 decided to erect a, a special chapel in the church for the, for, for the Eucharist. And so he constructed what is known as the Sistine Chapel, which of course perplexes visitors to Rome who walk in expecting to see some Michelangelo painting, but you know, it turns out there isn't. But Sixtus's, Sixtus built his Sistine Chapel in 1587 and he designed it very similar to the other building he was working on in 1587, which was the completion of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, which is the slot, which is the image you see on the right. And as you can see this very sort of vertical elevation of the space down below, the series of windows 
in the middle, and then the dome sitting on the top. Basically, his chapel was meant to be a miniature version of the core of St. Peter's Basilica. And again, part of the idea of the design of St. Peter's Dome is that Michelangelo spent 19 years working on the dome so he could put windows through the base of the dome, separating it from the design of the Pantheon, because where the Pantheon has the heavy concrete dome sitting on the walls. In the case of Michelangelo's church, you have this dome sitting on top of a cushion of light. And that effect of the light and then the dome hovering is how you evoke the concept of heaven, the divine, constructing a space that is meant to allude to paradise, heaven, the celestial, which is connected or hovering above the earth. What is the connector between the two? In the case of Sistine Chapel by, by Sixtus V, it is the Eucharist. So here is the, 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 ult the chapel ultimately uh, with its dome at the top, uh, the, uh, the um, Greek cross plan and the extraordinary tabernacle built by um, by his uh, by one of his close call by one of his collaborators and the dome when we look up at the inside you see this uh the 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 cushion of light and then the concentric series of angels working your way up to the top. So to make this very obviously an image of heaven so that we're not, there's no misunderstanding what's happening here. You have angels, 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 orders of angels, and then God the Father. This is exactly what they did in, this, in, in St. Peter's Basilica. Again, Michelangelo's enormous cushion of light. You have Christ and the apostles, angels, 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 God the Father. So this connection, this very obvious visible vision of the celestial using the architectural space and its decoration. Then underneath the chapel, underneath the floor of the chapel, Sixtus dug out a crypt and he had transported into that crypt an ancient chapel that had been placed in St. Mary Major back in the 8th century, 9th century. And the chapel contained the most important relics of this church, including the crib that Jesus was laid in, so a piece of the wood from the manger from Bethlehem, the remains of St. Jerome, who had died in the cave in Bethlehem where Jesus was born, and the first, or not the first, one of the first nativity sets designed by Arnolfo di Cambio, again, to create in that little chapel, a kind of Roman Bethlehem. And Sixtus had his architect, Domenico Fontana, lift the chapel out of its original space, move it over into his chapel and drop it into the crypt. Domenico Fontana was so proud of it. He wrote a whole book and did a bunch of designs of how I moved the chapel. And this again is part of Sixtus V, who was a very, very significant scripture scholar, is trying to draw out the idea of Bethlehem, the house of bread. And then above it, you'll have the heaven and in the, in the heavens. And in the middle, we're going to have the tabernacle where we keep the consecrated bread. So this idea of the, the incarnation in the house of bread, the tabernacle and heaven all uniting in one. And this is something that the Council of Trent had just elaborated and explained in of course session 13. And so you can see here in the, paint, in the image on the left how the crypt chapel is down below. So this is where the house of bread is. And we have the dome, and here is a much better image of the tabernacle uh, by again Ludovico di Duca, and the the same effect that Charles Borromeo had executed in his Peregrino Talbaldi tabernacle of a big old bronze structure. I mean, this is a ten thousand pound structure sitting on the fingertips of angels. And so what he's looking for, forgive me for the bad video, it's gonna make you a little seasick. I took it, I am not the world's greatest video maker, but I wanted you to get a feeling which is you're coming towards this and you look up and you understand that when you are standing before this tabernacle, 
underneath the incarnation, the piece of wood that took the body of Christ when it first came into the world. You have this heavens up above with the angels, the angels that we ask God during the mass to bring the offerings to, to, to up to heaven. And we have that connection between the two, between heaven and earth in the Eucharist. And what a powerful, brilliant way of illustrating that, that Sixtus V gave us. And I think what makes this particularly beautiful, what I find particularly lovely about it, is that while this is a chapel that is almost always overlooked and underrated, without this chapel, we wouldn't have the great works of Bernini that we love so much. It was this, it was this chapel that gave Bernini the idea for the, for the, for the altar of the chair in St. Peter's, one of the most breathtaking works we have. And then as a final note, Sixtus IV really made a point of using his own image as a way of leading people in Eucharistic devotion. His statue, this is his funerary statue, which you can see over here on the left, his statue is the is, is the unusual, if not the first time we see a funerary statue of a Pope, not standing, not lying in state, not seated in his throne, but we see Pope Sixtus V praying in adoration before the blessed sacrament. So literally we watch this perpetuity, as long as that chapel will stand, how does Sixtus V want us to see him? He wants us to see him in adoration. Very, very beautiful way of, of using his own image to really underscore the importance of the Eucharist. Now, speaking of adoration, adoration uh, of the blessed sacrament is something that really came into its own around 1550. It was primarily thanks, it already started in, in, in the 12th century, but in 1550, Philip Neri, uh, brings this brings this brings this devotion to Rome. Uh, it begins in Rome, and then it truly begins to take hold. And there is a pope who is Pope Clement the Eighth in uh, in 1598, so promoted the 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 forty hours devotion that the from in, in 1490 in 1592 in 1592 he so promoted the uh, forty hours devotion that for for an entire year the blessed sacrament was continuously adored from church to church to church, 40 hours and 40 hours and 40 hours and 40 hours. So really Rome was one immense space of Eucharistic de devotion under this, under this Pope. And um, the, uh, the interesting thing here is that this is a, 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 the left, it's a machine or a machina as they say, which is uh, put up for the 40 hours devotion. It's also done for the altars of repose. And this is actually one which dates from the Counter-Reformation era. It is still used on Holy Thursday in the Church of Santa Maria del Orto in Trastevere in Rome. And on the right, you see the machina, this incredibly elaborate construction that they put together for the Church of the Gesù. And this is actually to a design by John Lorenzo Bernini, who has this, again, look at the effect they're, they're trying to get here, this floating monstrance, this idea of something that, that rises us above the earth. Very, very beautiful beautiful and powerful and incredibly complex imagery. These things are made out of paper mache and wood and they're erected for the occasion and then taken down. Now in painting, something else happens. We've talked about architecture, we've talked about chapels, we've talked about liturgical objects, we've talked about objects. Uh, now we get to painting. We're gonna finish our talk today talking about a couple of paintings. And one of the most important things that happens art-wise when it comes to the question of reinforcing the importance of the, of the Eucharist in the mind of the viewer of a painting is that there is an iconographic shift. Pretty much every painting regarding the, 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 the Lord's Supper or the, the Lord's Supper uh, leading up to the mid 16th century, pretty much every painting likes to show the psychological drama of Jesus sitting at the table telling his, his, his apostles that one of them will betray him. And we can see the most famous, most beautiful, most remarkable version is Leonardo da Vinci's where Jesus has just said those words and we see the reality 
reaction of the apostles and we, we, re we really penetrate into this moment of Jesus's loneliness on the eve of his passion. But that gets shifted and that gets changed so that we no longer think about the moment of the betrayal, but we really begin in some of the mid 16th century, we begin to think about the Eucharist and Jesus's institution of the Eucharist. And that is what artists will be asked to produce the moment that Jesus first said those words, this is my body, which will be given up for you. And interestingly, one of the great, great painters of this subject was a man named Federico Fiore. His nickname is Barocci. If you ever look him up, he's a magnificent painter. He's one of my favorite painters. Um, Barocci is the name that you will usually find him other, under. Barocci was under Urbino, was, was from Urbino. Uh, he uh, is considered in art history the first great counter-reformation painter. And he was commissioned by Pope Clement VIII, the, the Pope of the Eucharist. He was commissioned by Pope Clement VIII to produce this painting called The Institution of the Eucharist for Santa Maria Sopra Minerva in Rome. It is in the chapel where uh, the Pope's parents are buried. So this is a highly personal commission. This is something the Pope cares deeply about. And he uh, wanted uh, uh, he wanted uh, Barocci, despite the fact that Barocci was known as never coming to Rome. He was an artist who would not set foot in Rome. So uh, that means the Pope had to hire him from Urbino, then Barocci would have to send drawings to Rome and the Pope would write back his critiques on the drawings. And because it's the Pope, we have the correspondence. So for art historians, this is a very exciting moment because it really gives us insight into how a work is commissioned. And just to underscore one last thing about Urban uh, uh, Clement VIII and his, his affection towards the Eucharist, um, the Roman journals made fun of him because he was so devout and so, 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 he was just in love with the Eucharist that he would occasionally cry during consecration. So we have this sort of, this sort of mean little local Roman newspapers making fun of him, but it attests to a man who really, he, he wanted to bring his church together under the sign of the Eucharist. And so this painting is a brilliant piece of work. Uh, Barocci is a lovely painter. He adds these sort of great contemporary uh, um, uh, elements. You have in the background, the silverware laid out. When you had great banquets in Rome, you would put out all your silverware so people could see your displays of beautiful flatware. Um, he adds a theatrical effect, the, uh, the, the curtain on the upper left-hand side, which is being drawn back. This is the way that you tell the viewer, listen, pay attention, something is happening. It's a way to kind of draw the attention, make the viewer lean in. We have these two fat little baby angels in adoration up above, and we even have a cranky Judas in the corner. But the fact is this painting is nothing more, nothing less than a total focus on the Eucharist. It's designed with three, uh, three triangles that, that uh, all depart from the head of Christ. And the first triangle comes from Jesus's head down to the two corners of the painting where we see these two young men. And the two young men are reaching down to pick up water, bread, wine from the space of the altar. As a matter of fact, that little stone thing at the bottom is the tabernacle. So they're picking up from the altar the offerings and they are bringing them up. So we start with the actual material, the, the matter that is placed physically on the altar. The second triangle goes from Jesus to the figure of Peter and the figure of John the Evangelist. You'll notice this very beautiful color he uses. It's called colore cangiante, where the colors seem to shimmer and move in the light. It's part of what makes the painting so uh, attractive. It catches your eye when you pass by in the chapel. And what do we see Peter and John doing? We see them deeply in reverence and adoration and prayer. So one of the things that the removal of the root screen does is it makes the priest visible. 
And so now the faithful stand and they watch the moment of consecration. And what do they see the priest doing? These incredibly large gestures, these very, very big gestures that make it very, very apparent, this reverence, the very deep bows from the waist, the, the open arms. And so these very uh, uh, dramatic, reverent, prayers that we see uh, uh, on the part of the two apostles. And then we get to our third triangle. And the third triangle is simply Christ. Christ, his arms, and then ultimately at the heart of that triangle is Jesus holding the host. And it's interesting because we have the letters from Clement VIII where he keeps telling Barocci, make it larger, make it more evident, and that to put the host over the red of his robe, which in Western art symbolizes Jesus's flesh. The blue is the grace, uh, uh, the divine, and the red is the, is the mortal body, is the flesh. So we put the two together and it really in the um, in, 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 in Eastern icons, it's much more evident, but here you see the same imagery where Jesus makes it very clear, this is my body. So that is one wonderful work that uh, shows us how it really, uh, it becomes like a recipe, the Barocci painting is like a recipe for the Eucharist, right? It's, 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 it's matter plus prayers equals the body of Christ. And so it's a very beautiful yet effective way for people to think about what, uh, what the Eucharist is and to try to understand or get their minds around the question of transubstantiation. Well, on the other side of town, really not very far away at all in Rome, uh, Caravaggio pretty much at the same time was working on a painting for the Oratorians. And let's just remind you, the Oratorians founded by St. Philip Neri are the ones who really brought Eucharistic adoration to Rome. So again, great, tremendous interest in drawing people's attention to the Eucharist. Now, he produced this painting in 1604. I personally, as a personal note, I consider it his most successful religious painting. Um, the entombment shows Jesus's body being placed into the tomb. It is a painting critiqued by the contemporaries for its simple background and of course it's quote excessive naturalism, i.e. meaning that the people surrounding Jesus do not look like they stepped out of central casting. Mary doesn't look like the 20 year old mother of a 33 year old man. Jesus looks a little bit green, his feet are a little bit dirty. This is the naturalism that people complain about because nothing hasn't been airbrushed or photoshopped and yet there is nothing really else that is natural in this painting, particularly the use of light. So Caravaggio in this painting puts these six figures against a blank background. There's nowhere else for you to look. There's nowhere else for you to go. It's a blank background, six figures placed against it. Then he uses this mysterious light, a light that has nothing to do with nature. It's not moonlight, it's not torchlight. It's like Caravaggio got into a time machine and went to like a Hollywood studio, brought himself a spotlight and brought it back to the 17th century. He uses the light to illuminate Mary Magdalene full in the face where she becomes like a beacon. When you look at her, her hands catch your eye, the face catches your eye but then our eyes begin to move downwards. And we pass through these two women, pass down over Nicodemus all the way to John the Evangelist through that luminous body of Christ suspended over the void, all the way down to this hand. So we're coming kind of like watching a ball come downstairs until we come to that last part where the hand of Christ touches the slab of stone. The body of Christ is a direct citation of Michelangelo's Pietà, which already tells us something very, very important. When Michelangelo designed the Pietà, he put Mary's hand uh, on around Jesus as which actually he's, she's touching him through a cloth, like a humeral cloth. Um, she put Mary's hand around Jesus's arm, but the other hand leaves Jesus's body free. And when you look at it carefully, it looks like Jesus's body, which is balanced on a per piece of cloth, is going to fall off the altar, fall off her lap and land on the altar. So Michelangelo is really, he is Mary bringing the body of Christ to you on the altar. 
In the case of Caravaggio, they're suspending the body over the altar, and then his fingers come down and touch this slab of stone, which is jutting out towards the viewer. It kind of aggressively seems to enter into the viewer's space. And you come down to an empty space underneath it, which might not seem strange to you, but is very, very strange to the 17th century viewer because there were rules in painting. And rule number one is, you have to complete your composition. If you don't know what to put down in the space, and if you don't know how to fill a space in a painting, you should not be painting, you should be making pizza. So the fact of the matter is that he has Jesus pointing to an empty spot in the painting as if to say, did you notice I left an empty spot in the painting? Now today, if you see this painting, it is in the Vatican Museums, it's sitting on a wall and you don't realize exactly what he was thinking, but we have to imagine it underneath an altar. Now imagine this empty space underneath the altar and you're waiting for something to happen. You are waiting for the priest to fill the space until the priest is celebrating mass and representing the sacrifice of Christ at that altar, the painting is incomplete. It is an extraordinary thing that the Caravaggio does because it's not just a question of I'm going to dump a body on you. It's not just a question of watch the Eucharist happen. It's a question of we cannot get this going unless you're there to participate. It demands, it demands that the viewer, you, the viewer participate in this Eucharistic celebration. And it really brings us to a sense of uh, 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 intense communication about the, the essential nature of the Eucharist to the church. So this is, a, these are just two of very many, many, many examples. Uh, up, in, uh, up in the north, uh, they chose just to give you some I'm closing on just one lovely image to show you there is more than just bodies uh, flopping around on an altarpiece. Up in the north in, in Antwerp, they found another way. These are virtually contemporary. This is a little bit, a couple, a couple decades later. They found a wonderful way of using still life and creating these domestic images. So these are images just to close instead of just images that go inside churches. There was also a movement for people to contemplate the Eucharist in their own homes by creating these extraordinarily beautiful, delicate, wonderful paintings that people could enjoy in their own houses. And with that, we close our little session of two, two visits. Thank you very, very, very much for inviting me and for listening to me and letting me talk to you about the things that interest me so much. I um, gave you a little bit, I have a few little extra readings which will be put into the chat, but I just wanted you to, um, uh, uh, particularly Charles Borromeo's book has been translated uh, into English and you can actually find it online. And if you don't feel like reading all of Charles Borromeo's instructions, Matthew Galagos did a wonderful summary uh, in the uh, Sacred Art Journal on sort of the essential points. So this is uh, it's just a few little ideas of things you might want to read. And with that, I am going to take off my screen and open it up for, I guess we will hand this over to you, Deacon Tim. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lev. Um, so the questions are uh, rolling in here. Uh, let me start with uh, a couple of really very broad ones. Um, the first has to do with the Orthodox and Eastern tradition generally. Um, Obviously, the, the direction is completely different. The rood screen uh, stays, be, it's an iconostasis. Um, things are taking place behind the screen. Can you talk a little bit about that as a, um, as a comparative experience, as an, a comparative um, artistic and liturgical program compared with uh, what we see uh, in this art of the Catholic reform? I, I stayed. I stayed muted. Um, the um, there's a there's a difficulty in the West, which is caused by 
um, this uh, it, 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 the incredibly empirical nature of the Renaissance and then the 16th century. So I think one of the problems is that the 16th century becomes more and more dependent on what their eyes see, what their fingers touch. They are also really in the heat and in the heart of the Protestant Reformation, where you have conflicting teachings that are, there are 50 million pieces of, and that's not an exaggeration, there are 50 million pieces of literature being circulated around Europe, around Western Europe uh, as of 1550, uh, thanks to the printing press, so people are inundated with information and 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 very very very. Um, uh, uh, they're challenged by the fact that they're uh, they're now becoming accustomed to touching. So I think there are two sort of evolving mindsets between uh, the Orthodox and the Byzantine Church, which doesn't kind of undergo all of this shakeup. And so I think that is why we have these two very sort of distinct why 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 the Byzantine Church continues to thrive. It's not that the iconostasis changes anything or is a bad thing or is a wrong thing. It's just that the iconostasis in the West um, becomes a kind of barrier to a, a, a people or a society that is, 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 is frustrated because they want to see and they want to participate. Um, so, and let's go in a, in a, in a different direction. Um, you uh, focused on the, the uh, uh, central um, um, creative and developmental world in Rome, um, but as a response in particular to the Reformation, um, as this um, architecture and painting, this whole program went into Central Europe um, and other places where uh, the uh, reformers' views were stronger, um, how did it adapt? And um, let me leave it at that. How did, how did it adapt? So um, can, can, you, can you give me that again? I think I missed a section of that, that question. Yes, so um, you talked really about uh, the genesis of all of this in Rome, in, in architecture and painting, um, but it, it's gonna go uh, elsewhere in Europe where the, where the reformers are, are stronger uh, and more uh, and heavier on the ground. How does it um, develop or adapt in that, uh, in that other European surrounding? So, I, so Rome is kind of the headquarters, uh, Rome, Rome, Milan, Bologna are the headquarters of this new kind of design. You'll find um, in, uh, in, in Spain, uh, Spain is a very, uh, it, it, it picks up a lot of the Counter-Reformation architecture, a lot of the Counter-Reformation type of painting. Um, France, not very much. Uh, as a matter of fact, France is a kind of a funny reception, even though France is, is Catholic. Uh, France is a sort of a funny reception to the counter reform and they don't really implement a lot of the new type of art and architecture thanks to Rubens. Uh, there's a tremendous movement in, um, in, uh, in, in Belgium and particularly in Antwerp where we see, actually in Rubens will do an entire cycle of ta tapestries which are called the triumph of the Eucharist. So we do have different ways of, um, uh, different, different, different ways of expressing um, uh, the centrality of the Eucharist. And the other, the other figures that will be essential are the Jesuits who will transplant, transplant and transport their type of architecture to all the many places they go in mission. So it actually is, um, uh, it is adaptable. It is especially adapted into the new world as new church churches are being built in the new world. But in other areas of, of Europe, surprisingly like France, it just never really takes. What about Eucharistic um, feast days? Was there special a decoration or artwork around particular uh, feast days or processions or other things like that? Oh, yes. The, uh, this, as a matter of fact, the Bernini drawing that I showed you earlier um, was one of many, many, many of these incredibly complicated 
floats and, 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 and arrangements that were put together only for the temporary you know, Corpus Domini uh, processions. And, and they would do these, these, it's a whole wealth of art. It could only be found in drawings and sketches because they're made out of paper mache or they're made out of wood and they were destroyed at the end of the festival. But it was, these, these, these are involving things that would be on uh, ropes or they would be on little, um, almost like um, uh, little elevators that could be lifted up. It, it's, it's, it's a fascinating type of proto CGI that uh, artists and really major artists like Bernini were involved in, in order to create these the very mystical scenes, these amazing scenes, which again, are part of helping a very empirical society, very accustomed to, I know what I've got in front of me, I know, I, 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 I read the pamphlets. It was a way of helping them sort of, you know, having their jaws drop for a moment so that they could enter into the concept of mystery. Okay. Um, were there other prelates in the church as um, strongly involved in providing instruction on art and architecture as, as Charles Borromeo? Yes, it's actually uh, the Charles Borromeo is the only prelate who writes on um, on uh, on architecture specifically, but for Caravaggio and for Barocci, there is another major figure whose name was uh, Gabriele Paliotti. He's Archbishop Gabriele Paliotti of Bologna, and he wrote a treatise on discourse on sacred and profane. It's actually that's been translated into English, and it's uh, produced by the Getty. And uh, it's a, he wrote really a handbook to help artists understand how they could participate, how they could become, and I quote, uh, mute theologians and or tacit preachers to the people. So it's actually, there was, there was a lot of assistance on the part of quite a few, there's another, there's another bishop named Aguki, but there were quite a few prelates who really were involved in trying to help artists get the best formation possible so as to be able to assist them in the work of creating, uh, making the, or instructing the people on, on, on the nature of the Eucharist. Reliquaries. Um, what role did relics play in Eucharistic piety? This phenomenon, for example, of bleeding hosts such as the relic of the blood of Christ in, in Bruges in Belgium um, and, and were reliquaries uh, related to Eucharistic piety? Did they uh, develop an artistic form or something um, interesting to talk about there? So there's a, there's a distinction we need to make here. Um, so when we talk about the relics or the, the objects that are connected with Eucharistic miracles is, is one thing. So we have, for example, an example of that is the Cathedral of Orvieto is an entire reliquary. The whole Cathedral of Orvieto is a reliquary for the stained corporal of the Eucharistic miracle that took place at Bolsena. So we have quite a few beautiful, magnificent structures for the um, uh, objects that are connected to a Eucharistic miracle. However, and Charles Borromeo was pretty clear about this, when so insofar as the relics of something like the bones of a saint or, 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 or sort of the physical relics of, uh, the object, the cloak of a saint, those, they, they're, 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 they're careful that they want them separated from the place of the tabernacle because the one thing they want to avoid is that the faithful think of the, um, the Eucharist as a relic. So they do make a big distinction. So that's one of the reasons why uh, someone like Sixtus V has to build his tabernacle elsewhere because you don't want it sitting on top of a relic because that way people, or, or there's no tabernacle on top of the tomb of St. Peter because you don't want people thinking, oh wait, I guess that's a relic. And so it's a, it's a very interesting issue that um, has to be addressed in architecture and in liturgical design in design of liturgical spaces, particularly in old churches that are built around relics during this period. It's an excellent question. Um, two questions here, I'll give you one after the other, where people really looked closely at the, at the paintings that you were showing. Um, one asks, I've always wondered if Caravaggio intended one to properly view the deposition while kneeling at the communion rail. 
Is that possible? It is highly possible. I mean, so um, it's in a, it was in a very small chapel. Uh, it's a side chapel. It would fit maybe five people if you're lucky. And in COVID times, one. Um, and so if there's a little communion rail on the right on the outside and it does, it would have a very, it would have a very good view from that point from the, from kneeling at the communion rail to the presence of the priest. I think an essential thing to remember is that that painting is incomplete without the presence of the priest and then to the body of Christ up above it. So I think that would have been, I think you're absolutely right, that it was really meant to create this, it would have its perfect uh, uh, angle as the, as, the, as the communicant was kneeling at the rail. In the Barocci painting, um, in your close-up of the third triangle uh, comprising Christ himself, there appear to be two figures in the back peering out from shadow um, they appeared at first blush almost demonic. Um, are they incidental? Um, I wonder if you might comment on them. So I think those two are um, those. So yes, so in part, uh, the problem is connected to the fact that my slide does not have enough resolution to, for me to blow it up that big without making the figures look blurry. Um, the, um, there's like a little figure on the left who's just, he's a part of a group on the left-hand side who's uh, talking to the other apostles. And then the other is like a further back figure. There is actually, um, there is actually, I don't know if we'll be able to see it very very well, but there is a very interesting little fun fact about this painting. Um, when um, the Pope commissioned the work, uh, Barocci had decided to, I'm putting up my slide, my slide for a second so you can see it, Barocci had decided to place the devil into the painting, and so the devil is right here. He painted the devil right here next to Judas speaking to him. And when the drawing came to Pope Clement, Pope Clement said, no, we can't have the devil. Here's Jesus, here's the devil, here's Judas. We can't have that. I just paint him out entirely. So um, the, the Barocci painted him out partially, but you can see the little hand on his shoulder. And that little hand on the shoulder is still the remains of the little demonic figure. This guy is just a guy who's cleaning the table. And this guy is just kind of talking in the background. But there was actually a little demonic figure over there in the corner. So there. Good, thank you. Um, the, the High Middle Ages was a great uh, period of uh, Eucharistic devotion, um, artistic expression, and so on. Can you compare um, the developments, in a, in, at least in a general way, at that time with um, with this uh, movement um, of the 16th and 17th century? So there are uh, there are a couple things. One is uh, yes, you are right. And in the 13th century, after the Fourth Lateran Council and the you know, the doctrine of transubstantiation and the age of the beautiful hymns written by uh, Thomas Aquinas and the age of the creation of the Fe feast of Corpus Domini, yes, of course. But the real um, uh, artistic response is in the construction of what you would call today or what we would call today the canopy or the baldacchino. But what they call at that time the ciborium, which is again because that structure, that canopy like structure sitting on top of the altar, in part is supposed to look like a chalice. And that is perhaps the greatest response artistically um, because there's still going to be screens. It's the greatest response artistically is um, the, 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 the construction of these chiborium. The second response is the, is the multiplication of side chapels. This is when we start building those Gothic cathedrals with ambulatories, with you know, chapel after chapel after chapel after chapel. So again, the idea of the sacrifice of the mass, the sacrifice of the mass, you go in and each priest is sacrificing, making the sacrifice of the mass. So much more of a kind of a concert evoking. And then insofar as art is concerned, an interesting thing they do, which I'm not, so an interesting thing they do is they do a lot of cautionary tales about profaning the host. So you have what pops up a lot in kind of 1300 and early 1400 are stories and images and narrative paintings of you know, what happens to people who profane the host. So, and the, the kind of reformation decides to go with, okay, let's, let's not worry about that. Let's, let's talk about proclaiming you know, how 
cool it is, how, how it's the body of Christ given up for you. So that's one of the biggest changes. Um, you gave a wonderful um, uh, explanation of the Sixtus V dome and the dome of St. Peter's, uh, the domes riding on, um, on, on, on air, on windows. Um, do you know whether uh, Michelangelo was aware of the dome of Hagia Sophia um, in Constantinople, which does have smaller windows, but, but a circle of windows that it, that it um, stands on? Uh, it's very likely. Uh, first of all, he often threatened to move to Constantinople and work for the Turks. <laughs> Um, but yes, that building is very, very, very well known, very, very, very famous. And, and yes, it, it is, um, it is, he doesn't say I've seen the Hagia Sophia and I thought it was really cool, but um, it, it, it is highly, highly likely that he was acquainted with, uh, with that building. And yes, with the uh, earliest attempts to create this separation between uh, the Pantheon, interestingly, which is a building dedicated to human beings who become gods. It's not entirely surprising that the Romans decide to take the giant concrete dome and fuse it to the walls of the, of the, of the structure, because if the lower part of the church is, lower part of the structure is earth and the dome is heaven, really the Pantheon with its diameter and the height and the diameter and the height exactly the same is a building that is architecturally talking to a world where they believe that men become gods. So when they build Hagia Sophia, one of the one of the big things is wait, we don't do that. So that first attempt to kind of create that little lacy line of windows underneath the dome to kind of detach it, which then Michelangelo takes to a whole new level when he succeeds in building those enormous windows so that you really have the effect of a floating dome. And anyway, the answer is yes. <laughs> Good. Well, I think maybe we'll finish on that question. I think our time is up. Um, thank you so much for your perspectives and for the, uh, for the lively uh, Q&A we've been able to have. Um, and we look forward to having you again in, in the future. So thank I you. I look forward to it too. Thank you.